share the screen. Okay, I've got time to start right now. Let me pull this up. This is just a shot from one of those videos recorded by the textbook author. And uh, I'm going to use this to sort of review where we've been, and where we're going. Um, so the first thing we did was the physical layer and the physical layer is just the the digital hardware and the medium that we use to do the communication the, that that together make the network. And um, so the physical layer can involve an, an optical communication system. It could be um, microwave, Wi-Fi, uh, Ethernet uh, system, all of these, you know, Ethernet's just wires uh, with some digital hardware on either end. And so, you know, it's physical layer is the sort of the, you know, it's the, the basic, think of it as the, the bottom most fundamental level that supports everything else on the network. And we talked about the link layer. Now the link layer is usually very closely related to whatever the physical layer is that's being used. So for example, if you're using cell phones uh, to do your network, if you're communicating with the internet, over your cell phone, the link layer would be the 3G or 4G or 5G system that your cell phone is using to connect to the internet. So the physical layer is whatever the physical infrastructure is for the cell phone system. And then the link layer, let's say, is your 4G or 5G. So that's the link layer. And if somebody tells you that you have a link layer that's a 4G layer, you pretty much automatically know that you're probably using a cell phone to physically do your communication with the internet. If someone tells you you're using 802.11 as the link layer, that would be a link layer, then you automatically know that you're using the, uh, the, the microwave uh, Wi-Fi, so 802.11, which is the link protocol, if you like, is what you use whenever you're using Wi-Fi as the physical layer. And um, then um, if you're using wires, there's a good chance uh, and you're using all the protocols related to Ethernet, uh, you, you know that you're pretty much using uh, e Ethernet cables so uh, to do the, your connection to the internet. So the link layer is often determined by whatever the physical layer is. So uh, somebody tells you what physical layer they're using and then you, you automatically might be able to tell are they using 4G or 5G or they use, maybe they're using or are they using why are they using uh, 802.11? Are they using Ethernet? So you can tell on how you're connected to the internet, what all of the protocols and, and processes are that are in the link layer that are associated with that physical layer. So link layer and physical layer are really usually closely tied together, very much so. Now, um, let me... Now let me uh, let me go to another uh, video here. Let me find it here. Now, well, here's where I want to go. Network services, open link. Okay, right in here, and talk about this. These are from the videos that you should be reviewing. Interview in this segment this week here. So let me jump ahead here. And they will. Let me try to to there. Okay. And will... Here's where I wanted to go. Okay, so 
Um, the uh, after the link layer, uh, the next layer is the uh, the network layer. Now, usually when you get on the the uh, the internet, and depending on what particular application or service that you're using on the internet, uh, you will have one of two kinds of connections that are made between you and whoever you're connected to on the internet. And uh, they're usually referred to as datagrams or virtual circuits. Let me first describe virtual circuits because the idea of circuits as a connection is uh, the, the oldest type of network connection. It goes to the telephone network. And that in the beginning with telephones, and we've talked about this before, uh, there was no electronic switching at all. And that uh, you would go to a telephone and you pick up the telephone and it would ring to a switchboard where an operator, a human operator sat. And the human operator would answer the, the, uh, your call and you would tell the operator who you want to talk to. And then they would have this, this big patch board basically. And then they would just connect your telephone with another telephone that came into that patch board and then ring the bell on the other telephone. And that is how the connection was made. There was a physical human being who connected the, the twisted wire pair coming from your telephone to the twisted wire pair going to someone else's telephone. So that was the very first telephone systems operated with operators. And, uh, you know, that was when I was very, very young. I would get on uh, a telephone. Uh, and um, by that time, there, there were electronic switches, but you could, there were still places in the, in the country, in the United States, where you had a telephone, you pick it up, and there would be a human being who actually did the switching for you. Okay. And, uh, but uh, the, those human beings were uh, replaced by uh, electronic switches, mechanical switches. And when you dialed a number, that the, the code of the number um, uh, it was sent as a series of pulses. So on a dial telephone, like you see here, and the, you had the, uh, when you dialed, you'd dial number one or the number two or the number three. If you dialed the number five, so you put your finger in the hole right next to the number five right there, and you rotate uh, the wheel around and then pull your finger out. And as the wheel spun back to its home position, it would send, if it was the number five, it would send five pulses. That's what it would do. And then to dial another number, you'd put your finger, let's say, in the hole marked eight, and you turn the dial there and let it go, and then it would dial eight pulses. So at the telephone switching office, uh, it would receive these pulses that you were dialing, and then those pulses were controlled what switch what other wire pair you were connected to with a mechanical switching system. So the mechanical human switching system was just replaced with a bunch of relays and whatever that do the switching. But the key thing with those early phone systems is that there would, it would be a direct wired connection between your telephone and the telephone of the person on the other end with whom you were speaking. So it was a circuit. It was a circuit, a wired circuit, which is, um, so they, were, they weren't virtual circuits. 
There were real circuits. Okay, now, a virtual circuit is one where, in the internet, is let's say I want to connect with a uh, Netflix server. And uh, video would be one application that is likely to use a virtual circuit. So I would want to connect to uh, Netflix. And so I'd put in the URL for uh, a Netflix video. Netflix would connect me with, to one of their many servers around the world. And um, then what would happen is a, the internet would connect, would decide what nodes needed to be connected between me and the Netflix server. And, and it would then, on, then it would then decide automatically all the connections that had to be made. It would make those connections. So every time if I was viewing a Netflix video, all of the packets generated out of the Netflix server would come all through that same set of nodes. So it would, it's called a virtual circuit because um, uh, it would decide which nodes had to be connected to which other nodes. Uh, you know, a, node one would connect to node two, connect to node three. So I'd go from Netflix to node one, to node two, to node three, then to my computer. And it was those same nodes for every packet that came out of the Netflix machine. So it used exactly the same path every time. So it was like a physical wired circuit, but the circuit wasn't even set up until I contacted Netflix and then the whole internet infrastructure would automatically set up this virtual circuit. And the reason why is because the virtual circuits typically are much better for giving you a good quality of service connection. You are more likely to have a good quality connection over a virtual circuit than you are with the datagram. Now I'll ex explain the datagram is it was originally set up for sending text messages. Okay. And um, so if I wanted to send an email or some other type of uh, message to another person on the internet, it wasn't absolutely critical that all the packets followed through the same nodes on the network. I could send one packet over one set of nodes, a second packet over a second set of nodes, uh, because uh, I could have uh, that. It wasn't that critical uh, that all the delays between the transmissions of all the packets be the same or be minimal or whatever. So. I would write a text message. It would each 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 packet would then potentially go over a completely different set of nodes, and then they would all be collected at the other end. Now, with a text message, it may or may not, depending on on which application you were using, it may not be viewed as being that critical that all of the packets be received. Uh, without an error. In other words, you have a spelling error in a word or a particular character isn't transmitted properly, you can pretty much still read the text message. So um, if you're not that terribly interested in the overall quality of the connection, uh, datagrams. So this was the very first applications with the internet, with the old ARPANET, were datagrams. And that in the very early days, the killer application was email. And um, there, there really wasn't even any texting at all. You just sent emails back and forth. So it was emails or FTP file downloads. So typically, you would send, send somebody an email 
and you would say, uh, the document I'm sending is located at this URL, and this is the name of the file, you would type in that URL, you'd connect to a file server, and then you'd go looking down the file server for the file that you wanted to download. So almost all internet traffic at the very beginning was email or file downloads using FTP. And um, if a file, it was not uncommon for a file download to have an error in it, and then you would have to go back and re-download it because it wasn't downloaded properly. So if you want better quality of service connection, like you might with a voice connection uh, or with a looking at a video, you might want to use a virtual circuit over the internet. But if that really wasn't that critical, um, if you're you know, somebody using a sending Twitter that goes over the internet or whatever, you know, uh, maybe the quality of service isn't that critical. You just want to get them the message that's approximately understandable from point A to point B. So these are typically the two kinds of, of uh, network connections that you will have on the internet with the network layer uh, in an application. So I would say typically videos would be best to go over uh, virtual circuits and many, many other applications that really isn't important. And it was really quite common to get a lot of downloading errors. And uh, that's that's what I remember. I get, you know, I try to download files and a lot of the times the files would be an error. Um, and uh, especially in, in the days of uh, uh, free music um, uh, and uh, when there really wasn't, uh, uh, there wasn't any iTunes or um, Amazon music or anything like that, you basically had a couple people setting up peer-to-peer -peer free music services and uh, you try to download a song, and the first two times you try to download it, there'd be an error, and you'd have to try to download it again. So um, uh, I'm, I'm really glad those early days are, are behind us. Okay, so you typically have datagrams and virtual circuits, uh, and uh, IP was designed to do datagrams. And um, so, of course, now it's been adapted and modified with other parts now so that, you know, IP, if you like, is sort of the, the basic ground element in the network layer. Everybody uses IP at the, at the base of the network and then you build things on top of the IP. So the IP is also used in, uh, uh, in doing virtual circuits. In other words, you have to have an IP address for wherever it is you're trying to do the virtual circuit connection. The whole internet is based on IP. So IP started off with just using datagrams, but now it's sort of expanded to be sort of the, the principal approach used uh, in establishing connections from one point on the network to the other. Now, the other thing that um, uh, the, uh, the videos and the textbook talks about in, in, the, in the network services area is the fact that the, the type of IP still being used is the IP version 4, and uh, I, we probably have actually run out of IP version 4 IP addresses. And uh, IP version 6 was, uh, was established to eliminate that problem that we've run out of IP addresses. Now, there have been lots of workarounds with IP version 4. And the textbook talks about these 
and the videos talk about these some of these workarounds. Uh, and uh, so you might want to look at that. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, it really is. Now, the beginning videos in this section. Uh, let me find them here. Let me pull this up here. OK. So here's my. Updated syllabus. I haven't added anything on to it this week, but. Um, so the last week, the videos were on the link layer on 802.11 and Ethernet and techniques that are used to um, try to make those more efficient. And um, switches, uh, the first set of videos this week talk about how switches versus hubs work. Now let me just mention that. Um, back in the very beginning days of the Ethernet. Uh, it was actually unusual for someone to have uh, in your office or in your home or whatever to have multiple items that you wanted to connect to the Ethernet. Most people had one computer and they connected that to their Ethernet and that was it. And if you wanted to have a couple of different items, you would use the hub. Now, basically, if you remember, what the Ethernet basically do, do, did was there's a uh, wires that just ran from one location to another, and everybody communicated over those same set of wires. Now, a hub would be a device where you may have, so if you have two devices, you would have wires coming from those two devices to hook to the Ethernet. But then in the hub, all those wires were connected together. So it was just like extending the length of the Ethernet wire and everything was just all connected together. Just imagine you just twist all the wires together. So now where you had one thing connected to the Ethernet, now you have two things coming and the wires are twisted together. OK, that's what a hub was. And that is the way we added things to our Ethernet was by using these hubs. And today, though, on a modern Ethernet connection, we use switches. And um, so uh, when we had using hubs, it was more likely that we would get um, collisions between messages being sent between all the devices hooked into the same hub. Those messages could collide with one another in the same way that different users on the Ethernet could send messages that would collide. Now, when they started using switches, the, the Ethernet idea was expanded and enhanced so that the switches, if you think of the switches, is adding an extra address. So you, you come in, let's say you're sitting in a, in a dorm, and let's say that whole dorm has one IP address. So there's one IP address to the dorm. Now what happens then is that they go into a switch and then what the switch does is it adds components to the IP address. It extends the IP address. And it keeps track of which extended IP address goes to which dorm room. So the one IP address for the dorm comes into the switch. The switch then adds numbers onto it, shall we say. And then each one of those extended IP addresses goes to individual dorm rooms. Now, when people connect with you, the switch knows where your dorm room is. And if they, uh, and, the, and the switch has stored in a table, if you like, who you are uh, and uh, automatically connects you to the right, uh, uh, connects 
the message through the switch to the right dorm room. Uh, so that's one of the ways that we have gotten around the fact that we've run out of IP addresses as we can cascade switches to extend our networks so we can get many, many more components connected to the internet by using switches to extend the networks. So, um, and, and if you look at the videos in the book, and in particular, read those sections in the book, it explains it in a bit more detail is how switches work and how they're similar, but yet different than what hubs used to do. You know, we used hubs when everybody could be assigned their own individual IP address. I can again remember in the early days of the internet, uh, in my home, um, I would connect, I had an internet service provider who wasn't the phone company and it wasn't the cable company because they didn't think the internet was important at that time. So there would be somebody else who started up a business to be an internet service provider and they would assign me in my home my own individual IP address. Um, and um, so I would have one IP address coming into my home. And uh, so uh, that's how that worked. And today, though, uh, it's uh, unlikely that, um, that the many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that might be connected to each internet service provider gets their own individual IP address. In other words, we have to apply these workarounds uh, to extend the number of people that can connect because we don't have an, enough IP addresses. But today with uh, you know everything being connected to the internet, I mean, I've got door locks in my house that are connected to the internet. And um, uh, you know, it, if my house is totally wired and totally connected, uh, so I mean, I'm sitting right here at my at this table at this desk, and my laptop's connected to the internet. My HomePod speaker is connected to the internet. My phone is connected to the internet, and my uh, iPad is connected to the internet, and then. Everybody else in my family has multiple devices connected to the internet. And um, the, uh, in, in including, like I said, things like door locks are connected to the internet. And if it weren't for, I have multiple switches in my home. In fact, um, at every ethernet outlet, every room that has an ethernet outlet in my home, I take that ethernet and I connect it to a switch. And then the switch might be connected to a smart TV and to uh, uh, a laptop and to other things. So the, this, we need to have these switches in order to make the modern ethernet work. So look at these videos here. Now we're going into the network. Uh, we've you, last week we did the link layer. Now we're going into the network layer. So we begin with these two videos and then down to these videos and uh, giving you sort of a basic um, foundation for the network. But it continues into next week. We continue discussing uh, the, uh, the internet. And in particular, we go into a lot more detail about how IP addresses work. And uh, so that will be coming up next week. And um, so that's all I have to say here. Um, and I'm not getting uh, too many questions and emails, so I'm assuming everybody kind of is following what's happening. Uh, and uh, are you be able to answer your own questions? And so you know where to find me if you need me.
So with that, let me finish doing my screen sharing. Here we go. So here I am. Well, look at everybody on there. And uh, so things are things are doing well. Uh, it's been dry here in Florida for the past few days. The weather's been nice. It's uh, and I'm still alive. Have I haven't caught the virus yet? So. You, you all doing okay there? Yes, sir. We are doing good. Yes, yes. You're okay. Yes, sir. And your, and your other courses are going okay? We, I was just talking with the other CS faculty, and they seem to be happy with how their courses are going. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody's laughing. They think it's funny. Uh, yeah, they're they're okay. They're decent. Decent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they actually think the uh, online courses are going better than the in-person courses. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't agree? No, we agree for sure. For sure. I'm 100% agree. Okay. Like, how are how are things in the U.S.? It's been good, hot weather. What's life? Well, um, yeah. I mean, Florida is always hot, and um, but the weather's been good over the last few days, and um, I uh, I'm getting. I don't watch the news so much anymore because it's the same damn news every day. <laughs> uh, and um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's it's been good here. I mean, at least uh, I like the food better. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Home food. Yeah. It's the yeah. best one. Yeah. So, I'm... Um, I'm glad you uh, you people are doing well, and um, you know, can continue to uh, look at the course videos and and look at the book. The book goes into things in more detail. The the videos are don't go into much detail, and uh, you really want to learn it. You have to look at the stuff in the book, and um, so. You know, continue doing that. I hope you're doing it, and I hope you're staying uh, current. And um, you know, the course is flying by. What this is, uh, what the, the third week already, and uh, while we go to the middle or end of July, we, we don't. You know, I, I, it doesn't seem like there are that many weeks left. So, uh, I. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. Stay healthy and uh, uh, God bless America. Yeah, yeah. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. I'll talk to you next time. Okay, sir. Thank you for the class. Yes, yeah. Good night. See you. Night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Sweet dreams. How was that? Ek hit. Was that? On the show. Ek gavno. Kati manu.